people with mental illness are 16 times more likely to be killed during a police encounter than other civilians. 66-year-old African-American Deborah Danner was killed by a New York police officer, a sergeant, on Tuesday. Danner had mental health issues, including schizophrenia. Police say she was shot and killed in her own home in the Bronx after a neighbor called 911. When police arrived, they found Danner naked in her bedroom, holding a pair of scissors. Authorities say Sergeant Hugh Barry fatally shot her after she picked up a baseball bat. That video from a nearby restaurant showing one officer approaching Alfred Alongo. Alongo backs away. Then this cruiser pulls in, seeming to corner him. From the left of the screen, you can see his sister approach. She's the one who called 911 to get him help because she said he was acting erratically. This is really the nightmare scenario for families with a loved one who has a mental illness and for law enforcement themselves. These are the sort of situations that we really work every day to prevent. Unfortunately, this seems to have ended in the worst case scenario. And as we've seen around the country with the data, it happens far too often. In the second video from a cell phone, you can see Olongo seeming to brace himself. Police called it a shooting stance. Four shots were fired, and an instant later, you can hear his sister's screams. We're all aware of the two frequent news stories about the mentally ill who come up against law enforcement instead of mental health professionals and end up dead. <laughs> Why couldn't you taste him? I told you he's sick. That's a decision that they make based on being in that environment. I can't see, smell, and hear what those officers are experiencing at the time. And I think one of the things we need to think about is this idea of when someone is having a medical emergency, why are we requiring law enforcement to step in? Why don't we have a mental health system that addresses these folks before these situations happen? Okay, so before I introduce you all, I wanted to know what were your thoughts and feelings about what you just saw? Um, well, I think uh, I, I have uh, mixed feelings about it. Uh, I certainly am alarmed by the number about um, people with mental illness being 16 times more likely to be um, killed in police encounters. Um, but I also have mixed feelings about some of the recommendations from uh, from the, one of the people who was speaking in it. So uh, I think there's some complicated issues here, and uh, I have mixed feelings about it. But I'm certainly concerned about that number and, and about that. Okay, thank well, you. The stories that they were presented. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I certainly sort of echo that. Um, situations like this are incredibly tragic when anyone has to lose a life, um, particularly with law enforcement. And I think to sort of echo Dr. Yanos's point, um, it is a very tricky situation. And I hope that sort of by talking amongst all of us with our different experience, we can really get a sense of all the different perspectives involved um, that um, are, I think are really important in considering here. Um, so I'm looking forward to having that discussion. Yeah, and I agree with uh, both Dr. Yanos and Beth that this is a very tragic occurrence whenever it occurs that, um, you know, when a police officer kills somebody who suffers from mental illness, it's tragic for both parties involved and families of both parties as well. And hopefully, as Beth said, that our discussion will help shed some light on both perspectives um, today. Okay. Well, thank you for your time and your candor and taking the time to join me on the show, Police State of Mind that seeks to address and bring awareness to police handling, or shall I say mishandling, of mentally ill persons. In a recent study, it is reported that almost half of the people who die at the hands of police have some kind of disability. And with police as the default responders to mental health calls, that number will only increase. Here with me to examine this issue and hopefully offer some remedy is Philip Yanos, who is a professor in psychology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. With him are two John Jay doctoral students, Beth Vaishankar and Ahmed and Atala. Beth, who is a fifth-year PhD student, was involved with crisis intervention training with members of NYPD, and Ahmed used to work with a local police department. Again, thank you. So I have some questions I'd like to start off with for the three of you to answer. You heard the staggering number, almost half. In your opinion, why is this the case? Well, I guess I would want to know, you know, how they're defining mental illness there, right? So, uh, mental illness, broadly speaking, is very common in society, right? So, uh, a quarter of people 
have a mental illness in the general population, you know, anyway, right? Um, so I would want to know if that's the, are they using a broad definition or are they focusing on what we would think of as severe or serious mental illness, which is a narrower group of people, about 5 to 7% of society. So I would want to look at that a little more closely. Uh, but I think that uh, it speaks to the fact that uh, uh, mental illness, broadly speaking, probably, um, does affect people's emotions and it, and it increases the likelihood that they might have some encounter with the police. Uh, it might be in terms of seeking assistance from the police. It might be that someone else um, is worried about them. And it might be that they've committed a crime. There are many different reasons uh, why that could occur. And I think the police's role in society is very complicated, which can be difficult probably for people who are coming into the departments with a classic idea of what a police officer does, you know, as just investigating crime and responding to crimes that are happening. But increasingly, we expect police officers to be able to respond to complicated situations that don't just res require arresting somebody. You know, they might require some kind of intervention that might call upon social skills, conversation skills, de-escalation skills. And that might be hard for some people who didn't go into it thinking that's what they were going to do. But that's increasingly what the, the job is about, I think. So I don't know if I've answered the question, but <laughs> that's, that was my thought. About yeah. That. <coughs> it's much appreciated. Something else that I think also comes to mind um, when we think about sort of the interaction of individuals with mental illness and uh, law enforcement is one sort of hypothesis that's sort of out there is that as, uh, as individuals with mental illness were discharged from sort of long-term hospital stay, uh, stays, which happened sort of in the 1960s, that we had this sort of um, we had a, a couple issues at hand. How were we to develop sort of a, an effective community mental health program that can accommodate these people's needs um, so that they can live uh, successfully and safely in the community? Um, and by and large, that's helped a lot of people still need more funding there. Um, but then there is a sort of a subset of people, which people often talk about, who sort of fell through the cracks and didn't get the services that they needed. Um, so they ended up on the streets or sort of more on the front lines in terms of uh, police officers' interactions with them. So I think in going back to your question, that might be one reason for why we're sort of seeing more of a spike there. So there's like a cycle of basically in and out of hospitalization. Yeah, I would say for, for a subset of people, um, I think sometimes that number can be exaggerated, but for a subset of people, certainly there so sometimes they're called frequent flyers. They go in and out of the hospital, um, and they often have interactions with many different sort of uh, community agencies, like like law enforcement, like lots of different um, uh, nonprofits and things like that. Right, and there's kind of one of the things that we've learned, you know, in this in terms of emergency room use and shelter use and some of these high intensity things that there's a small number of people that account for a big right. part of of those high intensity services. Right, so it is. It's not a very large group of people, but it's a group of people who draws a lot of resources, um, and they have a lot of needs. And they often have multiple needs, not just uh, mental health issues, but mm -hmm. perhaps substance use issues, perhaps uh, other health problems. You know, um, that that also draw, yeah. you know, services to them and, and tax the system. And so, I guess one of the things that's often been criticized is that there's fragmentation. So these different pieces are trying to address things. Separately, we don't have one thing that's kind of coming together to address their needs. And sometimes the things that they need the most, right, like housing, right, might be the thing that would be most helpful, getting a person a stable place to live, is kind of like the hardest thing to, to get, right, even though it seems kind of the most obvious and it's the most primary need that they have. Right, and I would just add that we're seeing this increase in police interactions with individuals who are mentally ill because there is sort of as Dr. Yanos mentioned, this lack of centralized resource system and lack of resources in general. Um, family members are unable to get their uh, loved ones into treatment and you know when they suffer an episode um, or an emotional breakdown, they end up calling police for, for help. And that's sort of where police are coming in to assist with those scenarios and many individuals who joined the police department in the first place, they didn't expect that to be their role. Mm -hmm. um, but because of deinstitutionalization back then, um, with hospitals releasing patients out onto the street and putting them back in the community, police officers are now forced to step up to take that role 
and play that role for community members. Um, and that could potentially explain why police officers are interacting more with people who are mentally ill. And, and I think Deborah Danner's example might, uh, its case might be an example of, of that type of situation because right. her neighbor wasn't calling her, calling the police because they were worried that they were at, at risk, the way I understand it. They were calling because they were worried about her, right. you know, um, because she was right. following a pattern that she followed when she wasn't doing well, and she was somebody who was well known to people in the building. So it wasn't calling for, you know, a, an arrest kind of approach. It was calling for something else to kind of calm a person down and get them to a hospital. Right. But um, that's not something that um, most police officers are trained to do, I guess. Okay. I have a next question mm -hmm. for you. So in the opening, the chief of police said, it's hard to know what police officers are thinking. But, Philip, could you speculate on what is going on from a psychological standpoint during these encounters for both parties involved, the police officer and the mentally ill? Well, so um, police officers are, um, a, you know, varied group of people, right, as varied as, as the general population is, right? But we know that many people in the general population um, hold um, negative stereotypes about people with mental illness. So they believe that people with mental illness are dangerous and incompetent. Um, you know, unable to get better, right? And so they endorse these views at the same rates, presumably, as people in the general population. So some police officers have personal experience with mental illness from family members or from themselves and might have more mo open views, but others might not have had those experiences and they may not have learned, they may not have been trained in certain ways, and they may endorse those views. So that would mean that they would expect to go into a situation with a uh, and expect that the person is dangerous, incompetent, unable to get better. Um, and that would bias them in their interaction. Uh, a lot of times people with mental illness have biases about the police as well. Um, and I have done some research about this at, in the past. And so often people feel that the police don't have their interests at heart, won't help them if they need their help. Um, and so you have kind of people coming at each other with these biases. You know, um, and that doesn't, it's not a good mix. It doesn't lead to a great um, uh, resolution of some kind of a conflict. So what it calls for is some strategy to de-escalate, to put the person who's in the lower power position, the person with the mental illness, uh, at ease. Let them know that, you know, I'm on your side. I'm not here to, um, to hurt you, you know, and, uh, and to turn, the, turn it around, turn the situation around. That's the kind of thing that mental health professionals are trained to do when they're interacting with someone who thinks that you're against them. Um, but it's, you know, it's a difficult thing to do, especially when you're carrying a weapon, mm -hmm. right? It's hard not to look like, yeah. you know, uh, somebody who's a threat if, if you're carrying a weapon. So in other words, mm -hmm. the, the bias is on both sides of the party? I think so, yeah. I mean, that's, that, and again, there's a power dynamic, right? So the police officer does have the power in the situation. But you do have people who are looking at each other with biases, and that leads to potentially an escalation of the situation. So again, I don't know what was going through Deborah Danner's mind, but I would imagine that the police officer entering the apartment may have escalated the situation. She already wasn't doing well, right? Um, but that may have led to some kind of increase in her belief that there was some kind of threat against her, right? So often people have what we could call persecutory delusions, right? They think that people are against them. So if you bring a law enforcement person to the picture, then that can escalate that. Mm. So, okay, to set up my next question, let's take a look at another clip. Frightening here is it sounds like um, Mr. Longo's sister did everything right. She called up, she said her brother was having a mental health emergency. She called several times. Um, not only did they send the police, but they were waited 50 minutes. Now, if someone <coughs> wants to report a mental health emergency, which could save other people, what kind of message is sent when you do this? And you simply, basically the message is sent, if you call to help the mentally ill, we will kill you, or we will kill them. Well, I think it's important to step back and if you think about mental illness like any other illness and you said this person was having a heart attack, let's call the police. 
we wouldn't be surprised that bad outcomes happen because that's simply not what a police officer is there for. What we need to do is get away from this situation where we wait until someone is in a crisis before we provide care. John Snook's message is one of prevention, that we shouldn't wait till there's a crisis. But if a loved one has a mental illness, if they had like an episode today, what can we or should we do to aside from using police? I think there are, there are some options out there and I, I completely agree with clearly that message of, of prevention and like doing everything we can to make sure people are connected to the services that they need before it escalates into a situation where police are involved. Um, but there are, sort of there are several, uh, I think, like resources out there, uh, particu particularly in our area. Um, there are hotlines that are available um, that people can call 24 hours a day. Um, there's a suicide hotline. I know there's another hotline. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but I think that's one thing a loved one can do. And also just be there with the person. And as Dr. Yanis was saying before, just be on their side and be supportive. Um, likely they want someone to hear them and listen to them, um, understand and understand what they're going through, that they're going through a real struggle. And from just some, from some of my limited uh, clinical experience, that tends to do quite a lot in de-escalating someone and sort of bringing them back to perhaps their baseline. So in other words, making sure that there's more, I guess, information available to everyone. Right. I mean, I think we have to have respect for the fact that this is a very hard thing for a person to do, to seek help, right? Um, so we're raised in the society to think that probably the worst thing to be is somebody with a mental illness, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, so then, if you start to think that this is happening to you, right, what do you want to do? You want to pretend it's not happening. You want to do everything you can to hide it. Um, and certainly, if your family is bringing up that they're concerned, you want to kind of push them away and, and friends. So, um, of course, if we had a more open attitude of society, we would imagine this is something that people would more readily seek help for, right? But especially when we're thinking about psychotic disorders, right, which are the most stigmatized disorders, uh, we have to have respect for the fact this is a challenging thing to do. So as professionals, what we do is when we are meeting somebody who's coming to the system for the first time, we, we, we have respect for that, and we try to help the person make sense of it. And of course, if we can undo stigma, then we can make it not such a bad thing, Right? Because the person is thinking, this means I'm not going to be able to get better. This means that I'm not going to be able to do anything in my life. Right? And if we can turn that around and help the person see that you know, your, your life is open to you, there's many things you'll be able to do with treatment and support, uh, then people are not going to be so reticent and avoidant of treatment so that it, it, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't get sought until things have reached a crisis point. So there are a lot of great new things that are being offered, such as the uh, uh, first episode psychosis treatment programs that are expanding um, in New York State um, that are trying to reach this group of people. Um, but, uh, and, and the parachute uh, programs, which are using this open dialogue model, um, really trying to you know, have respect for the difficulty of the situation. Um, but they're very small. These are, you know, these are not reaching everybody yet. Um, but these would, be, these would provide a good entry for people who are experiencing psychosis for the first time. Right, and all I would add is that um, we shouldn't consider that police officers can't play a preventative role, right? It's, although it is ideal that we can prevent all crisis uh, calls to police officers, it's unrealistic to do so. And I think that we need to start looking at police officers and training police officers to be a resource in themselves as well. I've done some research, um, even people in the mental health um, profession, they still have these bias to stigma, even though they know that, you know, people with mental illness, they can't really help it. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's interesting you bring it up because it's something that we've studied in our, in our lab where we've looked at uh, this phenomenon of associative stigma, right? So one of the things that I think happens is that um, mental health professionals are aware of how society perhaps looks down at them to some extent, right? Um, and they kind of pass that along to the people that they're supposed to be helping. Um, so many people um, who uh, are in, you know, getting treatment, um, a lot of their social interactions are with mental health professionals, and they can feel 
sometimes demean and put down. And that can lead to people wanting to avoid services, right? Um, but I think that um, most professionals um, do uh, care quite a bit about the people that they're working with. Uh, but we do have this you know, general phenomenon where um, the people with mental illness are demeaned and those who, who work with them, family members and professionals, are also sort of demeaned. And um, you know, getting rid of stigma has to be this very large enterprise in order to make these things okay and accepted in a larger way. Okay, thank you. So for my next question, it's clear mm -hmm. and fair to say that police are not properly trained to deal with those who have a mental illness. Crisis intervention training is a program that was designed to equip police with training that they need. Beth, you were involved with CIT and with the NYPD, so tell us a little more about this training. Sure. Uh, so last year I was involved as uh, one of the mental health trainers as part of the uh, CIT program and just broadly um, the idea behind CIT is one to sort of develop partnerships between law enforcement, the mental health community and also the mental health advocacy community um, in order to sort of divert individuals from the criminal justice system to, to the mental health system and two to make sure that all parties sort of involved um, are safe. So that includes community, that includes the uh, individual with mental illness and the officer. Um, so that was sort of the uh, sort of the overarching, those are the overarching goals of CIT. And um, it tends to be depending on sort of how the police department um, takes the training and sort of makes it their own. It tends to be a four to five day training um, which involves the officer sort of getting to know the etiology of mental, he uh, mental health disorders, uh, treatment options available, treatment options in the community available, and uh, like de-escalation tactics or how to sort of respond to someone with mental illness in the moment. Um, and uh, to that end, uh, we brought in trained actors to pl play various uh, symptoms, so we had someone playing um, an individual with schizophrenia, sort of displaying paranoia and things like that, someone else who was suicidal, and we would have the officers in the room take part in these role plays, and myself and the other trainer and also some of the uh, lieutenants involved in the training would provide sort of like real-time feedback um, so that they could get some as close in vivo training as possible. Um, so I think this is a really great effort that the, the city is undertaking uh, um, for that reason. It's sort of one of the gold standard uh, approaches right now uh, to, uh, again, bringing together all of these different forces and hoping to come to like sort of more of a centralized uh, uh, conclusion or um, pr uh, solving this problem. So I think it's certainly like we're kind of heading in the right direction there. And one other piece to the CIT training, one issue that uh, some of the officers tend to bring up is that sometimes their options are limited with what to do with someone with mental illness. So they can either take them to the hospital um, or perhaps bring them or arrest them and help them get services, help them get mental health services that way. Getting admitted to the hospital requires that you're a danger to yourself or someone else, okay. um, which may not always be the case for someone they need. Someone might be disturbed and in need of some care, but maybe not meeting that uh, threshold. Um, and so perhaps an officer might be thinking, hey, if I get this, if I arrest this person, perhaps they might be able to get connected to mental health services more quickly. Um, so another piece of the CIT uh, training is to sort of develop these drop-off centers um, for officers to sort of utilize so that people can be brought there in real time that are open 24 hours a day and receive sort of services that, that they need in that moment. Do you think that um, the training should be longer since there's still basically issues going on? I think it's hard to say, um, and I think it can that can sort of be an empirical question. I think researchers are looking at um, how much training is needed, if buffer trainings are needed, um, but I certainly think it's a, it's a good place to start having a, a four to five day uh, sort of intensive training um, and and seeing how that works for for the officers and perhaps having sort of buffer like I mentioned buffer trainings as you sort of move along um, and even I remember in in some of my trainings 
some of the officers even sort of expressed interest in getting back together in like six months to sort of debrief and talk about how it's been for them um, since they sort of have had the real training, so to speak, and can then sort of process what that's been like for them. Okay. Well, what are the benefits, again, of this training? So there is research out there, and like I mentioned before, it's um, it's sort of one of the most widely implemented uh, programs in, in the nation. Um, and looking at some of the research, we know that individuals who participate in this training um, tend to have uh, increased mental health knowledge, so they tend to know more about mental health conditions and why they happen, um, treatment options available, and also, um, which Dr. Yanis was referring to before, um, some reductions, at least Po right post-training in mental health stigma. We don't know how long those effects last for, if they last for one month or two months, um, but we know that we're certainly seeing some, some improvement there, some reductions in uh, stigmatizing beliefs about mental illness, which can certainly sort of, I, thi I think, like open the door for having a, a real dialogue with someone. And again, how did officers actually respond to this training? Uh, quite positively, uh, I in my uh, in my experience, I found that officers were really eager uh, to learn from us. They were eager to hear um, about our own clinical experiences, um, hear about the evidence for various disorders, um, and. Oftentimes, um, the, the officers who were in the room had some type of personal connection uh, to mental illness, so either they had an uncle with schizophrenia or a father who was going through depression. So there was certainly that sort of vested personal interest, and they were sort of coming from a place of, I think, compassion and wanting to learn more and uh, offer sort of more, like I said, warm and compassionate services to this population. Um, Ahmed, since she just said that if there's like a personal connection between the officers and mental illness, do you think that that actually helps? I think it can both help and hinder um, an officer's ability to interact with somebody who's mentally ill. It, for some officers, it serves as a source of, um, you know, a positive source that they, they look at their experiences and they're like, okay, I can empathize with the person in front of me. I understand what they're going through. For other officers, you know, who may have had to deal with a relative or a loved one who had this mental illness that affected their own quality of life. They may resent that person and they may be frustrated that they can't get help for that person and that may affect their work and color their interactions and fuel their biases, um, especially towards people who are mentally ill with some of the more severe illnesses that we discussed. Okay. For Beth, <coughs> do you think that this training, excuse me, training will remedy the problem? I don't know if there's sort of a cure-all. I think there are mul many levels involved, but I think that this is a really honest attempt um, to, to solve a problem. Um, and I think, one of the, I think one of the draws to CIT training is that, again, you're bringing a lot of the key players together and you're having them talk together, have conversations, um, and then just that process of listening to each other, um, understanding sort of another perspective. I think you can, we can then sort of forge more ground to um, hopefully remedying this problem. Um, so, li like I said, I think it's a, a great step um, in, in sort of the way we integrate a lot of these pieces that have seemed very fragmented in the past. Okay. And Ahmed, do you also agree that this is not like a cure-at-all solution? Um, I would most definitely agree. In fact, I would argue that it's a band-aid on a very large issue. Um, I don't believe the solution to solving these problematic interactions between police officers and those who are mentally ill is found in training. I think training is necessary for sure, should be implemented in the academy of all police departments, and every officer should know how to deal with somebody who's mentally ill. But I think ultimately until we address the issues of stigma in our society, those interactions are not gonna stop. Um, and I think that those, those police interactions, especially the problematic ones, are a symptom of a much larger, m much larger disorder that one is one of our society, right? A societal and institutionalized uh, stigma against mental illness. And those interactions are simply a manifestation of that. So I would argue that until we address that core, it's not gonna get better. Mm -hmm. I had a professor, she used to work in Rikers. She said that these trainings, well, in the state of New York, we just started these trainings like a few years ago and the rest of the country
is, you know, kind of ahead of us. What are your opinions on this? Well, I think that we tend to do things our own way in New York State <laughs> and um, especially in New York City. So that may have explain why we have not done things the same way. Um, New York City's police department is huge, right? Um, and um, it's, it presents a lot of logistical challenges in terms of doing something. And it has its own culture, you know, in, in, in terms of way of doing things. And it, it's very hard to make things move. You know, so that could be one of the explanations for it. So I'm glad that things are changing, things are moving in that direction. And yeah, it would be great if it was in the academy, if it was at the beginning, so everybody got it. It was part of the baseline. Um, I do want to say something that we haven't said yet, which I think needs to be said, which is that police officers have mental illness too, right? right. So police officers are people. People have mental illness. This is part of the human condition, right? Mm -hmm. Especially police officers are exposed to trauma, right? They are exposed to scary situations. They're exposed to deaths, right? right. Uh, they develop mental illness too. People develop mental illness in life, right? So that's one of the things that needs to be kind of brought into this discussion as well. It's not ne only an us and an mm -hmm. them situation. It's uh, we're all you know in this boat. Okay. So for Beth, in your opinion, should law enforcement be required to get this training? I would say so. Um, if we realistically look at the situation, as Ahmed mentioned, yes, this may not be um, you know, the solution to all of, sort of society's ails when it comes to this issue. Um, but if we know on the ground that these interactions are happening, it would seem prudent for um, officers to at least be equipped with the knowledge so that when they encounter these, encounter these situations, they'll have some skills and a, a sort of a toolkit from which to draw. Um, I know that there are um, several police departments sort of nationwide um, who are requiring uh, the CIT training for all officers. So not just sort of specific officers within each precinct, but for the entire uh, for the entire precinct. And I think that it seems to be the direction in terms of the way things are, are going. And Ahmed, do you also agree or disagree? Um, I would partially agree. I believe that every officer should be trained to, to handle mental illness to some degree. But um, under the CIT model, specifically crisis intervention teams, right, the officers who are being placed on these teams who get priority um, in certain states and certain departments to respond to jobs inc involving individuals who are mentally ill, I think that should be a choice for the officer to make. I don't think that we should force individuals to be on these teams who are sent out or are deployed to respond to every call that involves somebody who's mentally ill. Some people are simply not built for that. Some people are not willing to deal with that and that should be totally okay. We shouldn't force that on certain officers. But what we do need to implement, and we need to ask our police departments to implement is to give respect and priority to the individuals who are trained to respond to those calls, whether that means giving them an extra lunch break or something or giving them the hours that they need but whatever we have to do to make sure that they're available at all times to be able to, to be the first ones on scene for those calls. And for Philip? Um, I think it's a good thing. Um, again, I, I, um, I don't know it as much from the inside, you know, uh, uh, from the police officer's side. My perspective as a citizen, you know, I think um, more information and more skills is good, right? And again, thinking about the role of police officer being um, broaden thinking about it differently than maybe we have classically what we think from watching TV you know that this is uh, a, a multifaceted job mm -hmm. that is an important role for society you know in terms of you know a, a being a person who has authority to do certain things that none of us others people can do but also has specialized skills for dealing with complex situations to uh, reduce the likelihood that they're going right. to end in a way that's a threat to anybody, you mm -hmm. know. And of course, there's no way to, to eliminate that risk completely, but I think there are ways to make it better. So I think more training is, is, is good. And I know, you know, people are reluctant to do it, and um, it may not be something that they thought was part of the job, mm -hmm. but I think that it's a positive step. Right, and if I think about some of the training that I did, um, you know, we often talk about just basic communication strategies, right? Like what you're communicating verbally, what you're communicating non-verbally. 
And although these skills can be applied to an individual with mental illness, they can be applied to right, any, any citizen that you're interacting with, um, that you're trying to connect with, relate to, or sort of diffuse a situation. So I think I, I just wanted to, to also put that out there and saying perhaps why I think that it's a useful training, um, not just for sort of CIT officers, but it can be useful training for officers um, across the board. Right. So it sounds like it's more of a combination of training and education. Yeah. Okay. So next, mm -hmm. I'm in the, of the opinion that one of the things law enforcement should be required to get is regular counseling because they are at the front line of all kinds of crises, mm -hmm. which I am sure is mentally taxing. Now, I know in the black community, there is a social stigma for getting mental therapy. Ahmed, in your experience with a local police department, does that stigma exist for the blue community? I would say 100% it does. Um, I have yet to meet an officer who's openly admitted to receiving mental health counseling. Um, and part of that reason is from the get-go, when these individuals are applying to these departments, we subject them to psychological evaluations. We don't give them feedback on those psychological evaluations and we tell them you either pass or you fail, right? And from, and from that start, we already teach them that psychology is a bad thing. They learn the psychologist is the boogeyman to be avoided and they seek to stay far away from mental health training, right? And I can tell you that at m most precincts that you'll walk into, there are hundreds and hundreds of flyers all around the precinct advertising mental health counseling and whether or not those are utilized, I don't have the numbers for that, but I can tell you that many people that I've met do not take advantage of that system because doing so would put a mark on your record. It would prevent you from applying for certain positions and jobs without disclosing that you've received such counseling. It can even potentially put you on modified duty where you're no longer out on the streets and you're instead forced to sit behind a desk doing paperwork. And so it has a huge implications if you receive such services. I know that if you apply for the federal government, a position as an agent in one of the various departments, if you've received counseling within the last seven years, you have to disclose that. Mm -hmm. And they tell you it's not gonna affect your job, it's not gonna affect the chance of you getting hired, but because these positions are so competitive, it's easy to check off that box if you received it and just throw your pile out. And so a lot of people are really reluctant, a lot of officers are really reluctant to pursue such services. Mm -hmm. I have um, a counseling professor, and he said that usually when people come to see him, he tries to tell them that he won't give away um, that type of information so that um, anybody that's in law enforcement can try to come and see him since they need the services. Right, and unfortunately, a lot of those services are then pay out of pocket, right? So if, if a police officer wants to use their department insurance or any other insurance, there has to be a paper trail. And so unless the police officer is wealthy enough to afford sessions, which can be uh, upwards of $200 a session, most are not going to use those resources. So what we need to do on our part is offer our services pro bono for free to these individuals with the stipulation that there will be confidentiality. So that way they have the perks of confidentiality that's traditionally associated with paying out of pocket, but we also have a reduced fee. even if even as low as a sliding scale of maybe like $10 a session, $15 a session, but low enough to encourage these people to come in. And if you're already reluctant as a police officer to get help, if you have to pay $200, you're definitely not gonna get help. So in other words, do you think that these mental health services should be regulated for the police? I think we need to take those services out of the departments that the officers are employed by. So currently the way the model works, at least in New York, is that um, the same counselors who are hired by the department are the ones giving counseling to these officers, right? So they have access to these officers' records. They're hired by the department in which they're employed and the officers that they're seeing, and we need to separate that because that way officers won't feel scared that these individuals are gonna leave a note in their file or everything that they take notes on during their sessions are gonna end up in their professional files. So separating that mental, the mental health resources from the professional department aspect would be a great help. In other words, make it more, I guess, comfortable for people to access these services. Right, and as simple as possible. Okay, so I would like to say thank you to my guests for coming to the show. Thanks for thank having me. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you, and take care. Thanks.